Good morning. My name is Connor Prohaska, and I am the Senior Advisor and Chief of Staff of RPE. Um, before I, uh, one of my buddies is always fond of saying, before I speak, I'd like to say something. Um, and uh, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't start by saying thank you. Uh, thank you to City for hosting us. Thank you for NASA, uh, specifically Kira and Jay, um, for helping us get this together, doing this as a team. Uh, it's been a great team to work with. Um, we've really enjoyed the process, and uh, we're very thankful to, to be able to join you on this journey here and, and start what we believe is, is a great relationship of marrying not just different agencies, but the private sector. <coughs> Um, as well. Uh, I'd also like to thank um, Shane Kaczynski who, who did the majority of the legwork over at ARPA-E uh, with our team as well as all the judges because uh, you are taking time away from your day jobs to come here uh, and it is exciting and it is fun uh, and then last but not least everyone that not just uh, is a finalist but everyone that came forward participated put applications in uh, that's really the neat part of what is going on here at NASA iTech, which is to pull energy off the streets and into the eye and into the light. Uh, so we really, really want to just thank everybody. And before we keep going on, I want to just give all of our finalists a round of applause for making it this far. So. <laughs> Buzz Aldrin is fond of saying that exploration is not just part of our destiny, but it's our duty to future generations. At ARPA-E, just like NASA and its <clears throat> quest to explore, we're here to explore the world of energy. ARPA-E is, uh, for those of you that don't know, I'm, I'm going to give a little bit of a discussion on what ARPA-E is, our mission, where we see it going forward. Um, to start off, ARPA-E was modeled after DARPA. Uh, if you're familiar with DARPA, it's the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. We were really handy, and we just dropped the D uh, and added an E at the end. Uh, so we are Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy. Our job is to do moonshots in energy, and the irony that I said moonshots in a NASA forum is not lost on me here. The energy world needs moonshots. It needs those things that no one else has quite thought about yet. We're not here to advance uh, in small scale. We've got a lot of research, as Paul DeBar discussed last night, uh, Secretary DeBar discussed last night, we have tons of research at the Department of Energy uh, that works uh, to, to progress different technologies forward. We at ARPA-E see our job is to find out what's next. Uh, when I talk to industry, I usually start with saying, if you in the industry have dreamt it up or have thought about it, we, by almost a matter of principle, won't be doing it. Because we're trying to go beyond that. We're trying to find the next big thing. We're trying to search out the next George Mitchell who will fundamentally change the way that we generate power in this country. We're trying to find the next technology uh, that will fulfill our duty to our future generations. A little background on RPE is we were created in 2008 uh, by statute um, and then we actually started operations in 2009, which is great because that means this is our 10th birthday and then next year will be our 10th birthday again. Uh, because that's cooler than having a ninth and 11th birthday. The, uh, the, uh, the unique things about RPE are, first off, we have term appointments. Uh, our program directors come to us <coughs> from academia, private industry. Uh, they stay with us for a term of three to five years, and then they move back into their other roles or out into the, the rest of the world, uh, which serves two purposes. One, they're on the clock they know that they have a limited amount of time to make as big of an impact as possible, and it encourages them to do that. The second part is, is it builds an alumni network, a network in the energy industry that we are just now seeing mature. And the alumni network of RPE is very strong, um, creating new spinoffs, new clean tech energy industries, uh, new investment firms. Um, we're seeing this mature right now, and it's building on the ecosystem that is required for any of these things to be successful. As we talk in here, RPE technology is so far, if we're doing our job right, uh, so far early stage technology that it needs a little help. It's going to continue to need help. That leads me to the next thing that's unique about RPE, which is we don't just do science for the sake of science. 
uh, we're not doing science experiments. We need to make an impact. That is our goal. Part of that is our tech to market team. So we have program directors which are at the heart of RPE. They design the programs, they foster the programs, but in the development of those programs, we have tech to market advisors, uh, led by James Zaylor here, uh, that work with the program directors from conception of program through execution to help get our projects moving, not just to be a science experiment, but into the market to where they can really make an impact. It's a very, very important part of our overall mission and what we do at RPE. Um, before I hand it over to one of our amazing world-class uh, program directors, Dr. Rachel Slabon, uh, who will talk about one of our newest programs, I'd be remiss if I didn't speak a little bit about the most recent one we launched, which is we just announced a $35 million, $35 million FOA funding opportunity announcement for long duration storage, looking at storage ability, electrical storage that's not just in a matter of hours, but looking at days and weeks. Because uh, as we've heard multiple times here, I think everybody's come to the consensus that that's what's required to move forward in the energy sector. Uh, there's two days left to apply, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then, and last but not least, because we do have term limited employees at RPE, we are always consistently recruiting. Um, we are always taking applications uh, as tech to market advisors uh, or for program directors. Uh, we seek out the very best and brightest. We have been successful in doing that, uh, and it's created an amazing place to work. Uh, I have truly enjoyed all of my time at RPE. Uh, I know NASA ranks very high on the agency morale scale whenever the, uh, the annual uh, survey is done, but I'm confident if RPE was its own agency outside of the Department of Energy uh, and, and that survey was taken, we would be just up there with you because we do get to do the amazing things that others just dream about uh, across the industry, across the research and academia world, uh, and across the government. Uh, without any further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Rachel Slaybaugh, who's going to talk a little bit about our nuclear program that we launched. Uh, well, the, the final selections were just made two weeks ago, and uh, we're very, very excited about it. So, Dr. Slaybaugh. Thanks, Connor. And I'd like to start by just echoing the thanks he expressed to everybody here. I won't repeat repeat it in depth, but thank you very much for having us in this wonderful event. Um, so as Connor mentioned, I'm one of those term limited folks. Mm -hmm. So I've been at RPE um, for a little less than a year, uh, living in DC since January. So it's been kind of a wild ride. In my normal life, I'm a professor at Berkeley. Um, one of the things I'll mention uh, is that you can you can go on leave from a nonprofit to the government or from the government to a nonprofit. So some of the people who work with us are actually faculty at universities who come for a short period of time, three years to RPE. So that's what I, that's how I'm here. Um, so I'm going to talk, okay, here's the clicker, uh, in a little more depth about how we work, um, how our programs are created, what pro program directors really do. And then I'll make up what tech to market advisors and fellows really do, because I'm not one of them and I don't actually know. Um, so uh, you guys can just yell at me if I say something. Um, so uh, I apologize, I'm still recovering from a cold. Um, and then as Connor mentioned, I'm going to talk about the nuclear fission program that just launched. RPE has programs across a wide variety of areas, basically anything associated with the energy sector, we've done it. We've done it from the generation side, transmission, grid, storage, all those different facets. And it's really up to the program directors what areas we work on. And so we just launched our first one that is in nuclear fission. So that's been pretty exciting for us. So to talk a little bit more about why RPE, and I like to say a dedicated focus on impact, is we kind of have a joint approach of how we build things together. So we really try to have innovation and a startup-like culture where we're pushing things as fast as we can and asking for people to shoot for goals that are farther than they think are realistic. Um, one of the things that characterizes our funding opportunity announcements is that we develop metrics that are very measurable associated with what we're trying to achieve. And people are usually like, oh, that, that's impossible. And we're like, well, if it wasn't impossible, why would we be doing this? I mean, and so we don't always get to achieving those metrics by the end of the program, but 
a lot of the, the philosophy that we bring is putting a stake in the flag for this is where the world needs to get for us to move forward the way we want to. And by asking those big questions and throwing out those big challenges, it really gets people to push farther than they would otherwise. And so the extended storage FOA that's out right now, um, it's looking for, can you do 100 hours of storage? Um, and really thinking about how to make that cost effective. And so it's, it's pretty neat to throw these challenges out. And it's been quite reassuring, actually, to hear all the discussion about storage and that it's as important as we think it is, or every, everyone agrees about that. Um, we do a lot of collaboration with experts. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about the program development, but we don't operate in a vacuum, right? We're a really small office. There are about 15 people with my job, about 10 people in tech to market, and about five fellows. And we're sort of it on the idea generation, so there aren't a ton of us. So we do a lot of research engaging our communities, and we host workshops where we bring experts from the field together to get input on our ideas and try to vet those metrics and figure out, are we pushing hard enough? Um, inside of our office, we also have a fleet of consultants from Booz Allen Hamilton, and they're amazing. Uh, they do a lot of the technical work that helps us make sure we're inviting the right people, having the right conversations, engaging the right disciplines. So we'll, we'll do really interdisciplinary workshops. Um, we had a workshop on smart farms. Um, so how do you think about really pushing forward um, what's going on in agriculture so that you can dramatically increase output? And you know, if you're looking towards biofuels, that's a question. And so we brought together people from machine learning and data science, um, DARPA awardees who had developed really sophisticated low power sensors, people from traditional ag, seed vendors, biologists. And so you, we have the ability to convene all those different perspectives and really look at, okay, how do you form, how do you bring this together to solve problems differently and in a bigger way? Um, I guess that also hits work in, in diverse tech areas. We have things that are like algae in the bottom of the sea. We have um, fusion, we have grid storage, so we have a big diversity, and really it's all about building the better energy future. So program directors, they're probably the most visible people at ARPA-E, because we're the ones who go out and like stand up and talk like this. Um, and as I mentioned, there are about 15 of us, and we're, uh, I guess, People's told me the wrong thing. Our comms person said a quote that used to be on this slide Connor was going to say, and so I changed <laughs> it and made up my own quote. <laughs> so, so there's no quote for me in our slide deck. Uh, but it, So for me, why, why leave being a professor at Berkeley for a little while to come to RPE? And it, it was a big question. I'm pre-tenure. This is in many ways kind of crazy. Uh, but for me, it was, it's not just that I get to think deeply about how to disrupt my own field and also have resources to go attempt to do that. It's that I also get to put that in the context of the entire energy ecosystem. And we're, we're trying to disrupt all of it. So I get to come and ask big questions. I'm a nuclear engineer. I get to come ask big questions about nuclear energy. And that's been really fun. I've learned a lot. But I also get to help with smart farm workshops. Turns out data science problems are the same everywhere. Uh, cement workshops. Did you know how much CO2 is generated by the cement industry? It's crazy. Um, next week, we're doing a machine learning AI workshop. And so two weeks after that, or the, I don't know, whenever Mario's workshop is, we're doing a controls workshop. And so inside of ARPA-E, you get to learn about the white space and the cutting edge and all of the spaces that touch energy. And it's, it's just been really exciting and has refined how I think about the problems that I'm trying to solve and the questions that I'm asking. Um, and that's what we do as program directors. So our fundamental job, I probably have a slide at this at the end, but I think that the font's really small, so we're just not going to get there, I think. Um, we do program creation is the first part of our job, where we go and engage with the community, hold workshops, and look at what is that white space, and we write a funding opportunity announcement, so a call for proposals that researchers propose to. Then we do review and selection. So we convene um, expert reviewers, hold panels, da 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 And then we choose what teams uh, we want to fund. And it's not entirely rack and stack. It takes the reviews into account, but there's a lot of autonomy and authority given to the program director that 
I can basically pick whatever I want. I just need to be able to explain it to somebody and it needs to make sense. Um, so that's, that's really empowering. Um, and then after that happens, we go and work with the teams to actually figure out what the real project plan is. Because how many of you have, act have submitted proposals to government funding calls? OK, a number of you. And you sort of, you have the thing you actually want to do. And then there's the call. And so you, you kind of shoehorn what you actually want to do into the call. And you twist yourself around. And, you know, so we know people do that. And so we go visit each team and we're like, OK, great. What do you actually want to do? Um, how are we, act, like, at the end of this project, how are we going to have the thing that is really impactful be done so that you're ready for the next stage, whether it's venture capital, whether it's another program inside the government, um, you know, what, whatever is the next step. How are you going to get there? And we work to build technical milestones and tech-to-market milestones that we manage them to over the duration of the pro project. So I'm deeply familiar with this right now. This is my life this month. I've visited five teams in four days, and then I came here. Uh, and next week, I get to do it for the other half of the teams. Uh, and and it's, it's really fun. And they're not, most performers aren't really used to that, where the program director comes in, and they're like, OK, what do you need to succeed? How are we going to measure that? How are we going to manage you to that? Let's make a plan together. Um, and, and that's part of what I've found so exciting about RPE, is that reframing of working collaboratively to make sure everybody's really empowered to do the best work. Um, and then we manage them. And so we go and visit them a couple of times a year, and we stay really engaged all through the process to help make sure they really do have the resources to succeed. Um, and so that's kind of the program development side. And alongside us, we have tech to market. Um, and now we have a quote from James. James, you're famous. Every day I get to help prepare teams to move their groundbreaking technical achievements out of the lab and toward real world impact in the energy sector. And that, good quote. <laughs> and and that, that actually is really important. A lot of government funding can feel like it just gets a little thrown over the fence and it's not always clear who's tracking the impact. And we really do care about that the dollars we're using make a difference in the world. And so we, and different teams need different things, right? We fund university professors, we fund startups, we fund you know, research arms inside of big corporations, and they all have different challenges of getting their products out into the world. So if we're funding a team inside of Westinghouse, it's like, OK, what do you need at the end of this to prove to your management that it's worth continuing investing in this technology? If you're a university professor, it's, do you care at all about starting a business? OK, no. Who on your team does? How do we, you know, it's getting, getting all those matched up. And that's where the tech to market people really come to play. And their backgrounds are pretty diverse. Some of them have been inside of large corporations. Some of them have been inside of startups. So they understand the different kind of company spaces. And then many of them have deep knowledge in specific sectors. So they can help our teams make the right connections. And the fellows are, it's definitely the best job that we have. Um, I wish I had been a fellow. Uh, so the fellows basically do the same thing as program directors, but they don't have to do the paperwork. <laughs> uh, so, That's the uh, <laughs> and Vicky's one of our fellows who got to, who's here today, which is great. Um, so it's usually two years. They come after grad school instead of doing a postdoc, or may, maybe after a postdoc. Um, and there are people who are really interested in energy innovation. They usually did hard tech research, but with a different frame, or are really interested in bigger impact. And they come and they help with program development. So they'll often dive in with a program director and co-develop something, or they'll do their own research. And they'll say, hey, what do you think about this idea? We should do this. Um, so they have a lot of autonomy and research authority. And then they get to go um, help with the workshops, help do program development, help with team management. And, it, and they're really, I mean, it's the, the best thing about RPE, maybe there are a lot of best things, but the very best thing is that you get to work with all these really brilliant people. And so when I'm out of ideas, which happens a lot, there are so many other people with ideas. It's, re it's really great. And so the fellows are just get to do all of the fun part. <laughs> um, and, I, and I bring all this up because, a, as Connor mentioned, we're term limited. So everybody is turning over. For fellows two years, PDs in tech to market, three, three years. So we're always hiring. 
I know you all have jobs, but I know that you all know super talented people. So if you know people who you think actually might be a good fit in one of these areas, we have a big budget this year. <laughs> um, OK, and now I'll talk about my program. So this is the thing that I've spent the last year working on at RPE. Um, it's called, so we acro name everything. All of our programs have fun names. Um, Lisa Meitner co-discovered Fission. So this program is actually a tribute to Lisa Meitner, who co-discovered Fission. And it stands for Modeling Enhanced Innovations Trailblazing Nuclear Energy Reinvigoration. Uh, one of the main skills of our program directors is acronaming. <laughs> um, and I, I'm actually really proud of this. This is our logo. It has all of my favorite equations on it. Um, and our program is really based on the idea that advanced nuclear reactors actually could be commercially desirable products and could be really important to the energy future. And I'll talk a little bit about the current challenges in nuclear technology, but we're like, okay, so if this technology is really going to contribute as we think about how to move to all clean energy sources, what do we need to do? Well, <laughs> we need to build reactors so that they are walk away safe, so that we can build them quickly, um, so that they're safeguardable, cost competitive, and relevant in a variety of markets. And by relevant in a variety of markets, I mean either able to load follow in a way that works with an intermittent resource grid, or provide high temperature process heat, because that's one of the things we're gonna need to work on. And so the question is, what technologies can be developed to enable advanced reactors to meet these goals? And when I say advanced reactors, I mean not light water reactor technology. So all the reactors, almost all the reactors we have in the world today use water as a coolant. Um, all the advanced reactors use some other thing, and there are like a bunch of different kinds of them. We're not going to get into the details, but they don't use water. And the key features of advanced reactors that are compelling, why we're looking at them, is basically it is less expensive to make them safe than light water reactors. And they have a bunch of properties that might help deal with nuclear waste. So a lot of the advanced reactors can consume nuclear waste. So one of those challenges, as Jason mentioned yesterday at lunch, we have technical solutions to the nuclear waste problem, but none of them have been implemented. There are a lot of policy barriers. So advanced reactors are one of the ways to help deal with that challenge. Um, oh, and many of them operate at high temperatures, so 600 to 900 degrees Celsius. So if you're interested in process heat, that's a, it's a good source. Um, all right, the animation's a lot of order. Okay, so what are the problems with nuclear that we're trying to solve? So existing reactors, a, a new reactor plant that's a gigawatt light water, real expensive to build, real uncertain how expensive how expensive it's going to be, and very expensive how long or very uncertain how long it's going to take. Um, so this is the average overnight capital cost. You'll see in North America, it's like, who knows? I mean, so city people, you're thinking about investing in this. How do you figure out what risk? I mean, it's a mess. Um, Europe, doing slightly worse. <laughs> um, Asia, killing it. Uh, if you want to build a nuclear reactor, you should go do it in Korea. They're building them on budget and on time. That's about it. Everybody else, it's bad. Um, and so those are new builds, but what about existing reactors? Many of you may have heard about existing reactors are shutting down before their planned lifetimes. We talked a lot yesterday about very cheap natural gas, negative pricing, um, basically renewables are totally free to put on the grid. So nuclear has very high operations and maintenance costs compared to other technologies. So fossil fuels, fuel cost is the primary driver out of their total cost. Whereas nuclear, the fuel cost is really low. Um, nuclear fuel is like pretty efficient. It's about 200 million times more efficient than fossil fuel, so fuel's pretty cheap. Um, but a lot of O&M costs. So when we're thinking about what we need to do, we need to figure out how to bring down capital costs, improve the certainty in the cost, improve the certainty in the timeline, and reduce O&M costs. So our program is looking at all of the things that you need to actually make that happen. But this is uh, my personal PowerPoint paint skills. You should all, you should all be impressed. Um, 
uh, I made this at the suggestion of, of a fellow who was like, you should show people what you're actually talking about. Uh, so you'll notice that the core is grayed out. So we have lots of reactor core technologies. People know how to make that part happen. But if you actually want to build things on time and on budget and integrate them with the grid and all that stuff, you need the rest of this technology to be ready when the reactor core is ready. So the idea of Meitner is really to make sure that ecosystem of technologies is available so we can actually meet the goals that we're talking about. So we, in our call for proposals, we said people could look at controls and diagnostics, robotics, maintenance, uh, materials and chemistry, power conversion, process heat, grid integration, and we got proposals in all those areas. Um, and uh, one of the bonuses of Meitner, so a, a tribute to Secretary DeBar, the national labs have really phenomenal resources in nuclear technology. They're very difficult and expensive to duplicate in the private sector. So what we have as part of the Meitner program, so not we give our awardees money to do research directly, and we also give them access to the resource team. So the resource team is a collection of experts inside the nas national laboratory system where there's maybe only one expert in, you know, seismic nuclear, blah, 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 or their software, or their supercomputers. Um, so instead of trying to have the teams fight over who's going to get which expert, they all get access to them collectively. So we have modeling and simulation resources, subject matter experts, and we're making all of our teams do techno-economic analysis because it's not that easy to do techno-economic analysis for an advanced reactor, and so there are a small number of experts who have some skill in that, and so this, we're having our teams work with the resource team. Um, and that, that's been kind of nuts to set up because we've never done anything like it before, but it's been pretty exciting, and this week the resource team has gotten to talk to the awardees and everybody's excited and we're figuring out who's doing what. And then finally, I talked about the metrics. Sorry, it's a dense chart. Hopefully the font's big enough. Um, <coughs> but these were the metrics that we put in our FOA. That we're saying, if you want to really build a new advanced reactor, this is what you have to do. You have to have overnight construction costs be less than $2 a watt electric. This is one of the hardest ones to meet. Um, we want you to be able to build on site in less than two years. Most people think they can do that. We want you to have fewer than 50 people per gigawatt electric to operate your plant. People are also having a real tough time. These are the two sticking points, having a very low staffing level and a very low construction cost. Um, we also want to make sure, so emergency planning zone is like if something goes terribly, terribly wrong where you have to evacuate people. So we're saying you don't have to evacuate anyone ever. That's one of our requirements. Um, if something goes terribly, terribly wrong, you don't need human response within 30 days, so basically a long time. You don't need any backup power, and you need to be able to do at least twice as well as the current ability to integrate with the grid, and you need to be able to, prov or you need to be able to provide at least 600 degrees of high temperature process heat. So we're kind of trying to get people to shoot at all of the things at one time. We'll see. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about three of the teams that we have selected that I think have some relevance to the NASA mission. So the reactors that NASA is interested in are very small, very energy dense. Um, so one of the things that you need inside of a reactor is called a moderator. So quick nuclear physics 101, um, fission, uh, uranium atom splits into two pieces and you get a bunch of you get more neutrons out of that, you get heat. The heat is what actually eventually generates electricity. So the energy of the neutron, so neutron hits uranium-235, splits into pieces. The energy of the neutron causing the fission matters. We classify that two ways. One is fast, so if the neutron comes directly out of fission, it's born at one or two mega electron volts, causes more fission, it's fast. If on the other hand, we have to slow the neutrons down so that their uh, thermal equilibrium sort of 25 milli electron volts instead of two mega electron volts. Um, and then it causes fission. That's a thermal reactor because it's in thermal equilibrium. So for some reactors, we need to slow the neutrons down to make the fission happen is kind of the point of that. And that process is called moderation. So we need a moderator to, I don't know why they call it moderator. Um, but slow the, slows the neutrons down. 
Um, the way we do that right now for a lot of reactors, especially a lot of advanced reactors, the moderators aren't that efficient, and so we end up with reactors that are really big. So you need a lot of material to slow the neutrons down enough to get enough of them to cause the fission. What this team is working on is high performance moderators. So moderators that are much more effective at moderating so that you need a much smaller amount of material to slow the neutrons down. And they can do that while withstanding very high temperatures. So the combination of being able to work at high temperature and be really spatially dense, volumetrically dense to slow the neutrons down efficiently is a tough problem. So we have uh, the Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation um, is working on that problem. And this is what they say they're gonna look like. So they're looking at um, basically really increasing the power density so the reactor can be a lot smaller. Um, and so they're looking at um, basically very small modular reactors and you could use several of them to replace a big reactor if you wanted to. Um, and the whole thing is how do you make it super small so it fits on the back of a truck? And so this kind of moderator <laughs> technology is enabling for that. And there are some real challenges to that. They, one of the things they're looking at is hydrogen. Turns out hydrogen's real small and it wants to go everywhere, so keeping it where you want it is kind of tricky. Um, the other thing that they're looking at is a beryllium technology, and beryllium's a toxic material, so that's kind of a pain. Um, so we'll see. But we're pretty excited about this, and I, I think it might be relevant for NASA. Um, so my, well, all right, my animation got out of order. Um, another thing we're really interested in is um, autonomous controls. So we're looking at an NC State-led team with a bunch of partners, including um, reactor technology companies and reactor software vendors who are looking at using AI and machine learning to strategically design how you sensor a reactor so that you can get all the sensors in the right place with the right information so that you can do the control strategy really effectively. So you can have things as automated as possible, very little operator intervention, and you can start from the beginning getting all the sensors in the right place with the right signals. Um, so we're excited about them. And then the last one, again I like, is, uh, so the kilopower reactor is the one that NASA's working on. A larger version of that is called the megapower reactor. This is a thermal reactor version of the megapower. So megapower and kilopower are fast reactors where the fission happens with fast <coughs> neutrons. This is the same thing, but with thermal neutrons instead. Um, and so it's a self-regulating core that basically temperature changes cause it to control itself. Um, it can be 100% factory fabricated. They're looking for a one month reactor deployment time. Um, their real simplification is they're going from like 100 safety systems to three, uh, dramatically reducing construction time. They think this can have you know one maintenance person who comes and checks things every now and again. Um, and they're also using uh, double-ended heat pipes, so that's one of the things that they're working on. Um, and there are some challenges, right? There, we, no one's tried to make a reactor that works like this before. Um, there are a lot of materials research challenges to be addressed, and they're also developing um, the moderator to make sure it actually works correctly. Um, and so I think I've got five minutes left, so I'm gonna, okay. Program directors, they're awesome. So is Tech to Market. Fellows are even better. Okay, <laughs> I'll take questions. <laughs> Sure, oh right, so another, I didn't even mention that step. So we often, before a FOA comes out, we'll have a teaming announcement, which is basically a, a one page, here's what the program is probably gonna be about, go start forming your teams. And so the teaming announcement is a way to sort of advertise what your capabilities are and also look for other people if you need to fill in your gaps. So yeah, if you're interested, definitely sign up. So yesterday, both Matt and, and um, Jason put up kind of the cost curve from kind of the, the low-end solar wind 
and put nuclear way out there. And you just, your, your last slide was up for about 10 seconds there in terms of what you think the end state cost is. Could you give us a sense of where you think this ultimately comes out of all of this innovation ending up on the cost curve? So we're hoping that the installation cost is $2 a watt, or which is comparable to what those are going in for. So, I mean, some people are speculating comparable that. To which? Uh, so to where, where gas is now okay. and where solar is going. Solar might end up cheaper. People are talking that solar might get down to a dollar a watt. But that's without considering um, storage requirements. So solar plus storage is probably going to be cost equitable, we're hoping, with new nuclear. Right. So that's the goal. That's a huge, yeah, that's a huge. Yeah. yeah. So you gave the requirements that you wanted the people to meet all those things. But it seems like you almost need all of those pieces to meet those requirements. And how do you get the teams to working together? Because you really need all of them to, to make that goal. Yeah, that's, it's a good question. And so some of it is, I mean, we knew that no one technology would be able to shift the thing to meet all, everything. Um, and so some of it was outlining how, what they're doing, which parts it attacks. And so we tried to select a, a collection of areas so that collectively um, they'll be able to enable things to meet, enable new reactors to meet all the goals. And the teams do end up having some interaction with one another, so there's, there's a lot of cross-pollination. So we have um, annual meetings, and we've already actually started introducing some of the teams to one another. Um, so for example, we have a team looking at seismic isolation to make sure the seismic, so the seismic and the cement in nuclear is like horribly expensive. Nuclear reactors are just 50% really expensive, complicated concrete. Uh, partly because of seismic concerns. And so we have a cement team and a seismic team, and we've already introduced them, and they're already having a phone call, I think, today, actually, to start I exchanging ideas. So some of it is just building the ecosystem inside the program. So when you get done with this, are you actually planning a demonstration of? So some of our teams, we're uh, getting them to have scaled prototypes. Um, nobody's going to have a nuclear demonstration at the end of this program, but what we're trying to do is set them up and make sure they have that as part of their roadmap. So a lot of our teams have when they want to do a nuclear demonstration. Um, but in nuclear, usually what you do is a uh, scaled prototype and then a full-scaled prototype with electrical heaters, and you prove that everything else works without the nuclear part because it's way cheaper, and then you go do the nuclear part. And so Idaho National Lab is actually setting themselves up to be a host site for demonstration reactors and test reactors. Hey, hey Rachel. Um, so the work we were doing in NASA relative to nuclear fission, I think we learned that it's equal parts technology development and policy and regulation. And, and those latter elements were actually the more difficult ones to overcome. So yeah. is anything in your program trying to address policy regulation issues? So ARPA-E formally only works on technology. Yeah. Um, some of the things we're doing is one, we're, we're forming what's called an input group. So a lot of people are really interested in this program. So we're bringing stakeholders together and facilitating interaction with the performance teams and the NRC is part of that. So we, we're having discussions with the NRC so they know what we're doing. Um, the other things about regulation is if you can demonstrate that you don't need backup power, human intervention for 30 days, or an evacuation plan, a lot of things get easier. Yeah. So that's somehow we're trying to deal with that. Good. Thanks. Yeah. So yesterday we heard that, um, that, you know, I mean, we obviously can't see very clearly which technologies are going to be the ones that are really winning. and and. Uh, one of the challenges or the thought process relative to nuclear was what do we do with the waste? And you had mentioned that uh, some of the reactor developments that you guys are developing are going to help with that waste problem. And so how does it help and by how much yeah. will it make a difference on how people feel about uh, the future of nuclear power? Yeah. So I can answer the first part. I don't know about the second one. Um, yeah. So how, how will it change how people feel? That's hard. It depends on how well we can articulate the solution. Uh, but right now, when we take fuel out of a reactor, we've consumed about 1% of the energy that's available in it. 
And uh, when you, I mentioned a uranium atom splits into two pieces. The two things it splits into is kind of a chicken soup of the periodic table. And that is where the radiation comes from. So you get all this stuff out of fission and it's radioactive for a long time. Many of those materials can actually be consumed. So they can be um, transformed into different materials that are, radioact are not radioactive or radioactive for less time. And some of them can fission and produce more electricity. So we can take the fuel and recycle it in a process called reprocessing. They do it um, to some degree in France and Russia and Japan. Um, and then once you have new fuel, you can go put it into a fast reactor. So those high energy neutrons can cause some things to fission that don't happen with thermal neutrons. So right now all of our reactors are the low speed thermal kind, and that only causes a very small amount of types of fission. With the fast neutrons, a bunch more stuff can fission. And so you can burn up the waste, transform it into other stuff, and get more energy out of it. And so if you have the most efficient recycling system, you can take things that are radioactive for hundreds of thousands of years to less than a thousand years. And we have buildings older than that. <laughs> so, so I think we can deal with it if it's that kind of time scale. Okay, that's great. And then I have a follow-up question. I, I, along the lines of what Harry said, um, it, I, I don't know how ARPA-E works relative, but when we, when we get into these kind of complex integrated systems at NASA, we, we combine the entire team and have top-down requirements. And so you have several figures of merit that you're optimizing on, and if you optimize individually, then you're going to sub-optimize the others. And so um, having individual advancements in each of these areas is fabulous, but how, you know, yeah. how do you, I do think bringing an institute together or some form of integrated, um, uh, top-down driven yeah. uh, decision make iterative design activities makes sense is that something that you're so anticipating I, doing I think that's a that is a good approach we couldn't do that for this program mm -hmm. um, I think it's a good thought for either a next ARPA E program or maybe something that is convened inside the office of nuclear energy mm -hmm. um, one of those things and now that this is launched and we're starting to get a handle on what it all looks like kind of the discussion of what what next from a programmatic standpoint, because you're, you're right. You, if everybody's solving different problems and you solve them in a way that aren't compatible with one another, it doesn't really work. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. I think I'm past time. So thank you all for your time and attention.